from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, I'm John Fenn at the American Folklife Center, and I'm here with Huda Asfor and Kamyar Arsani, and uh, they're going to be playing in our Archive Challenge Showcase here in 2018. Um, so I want to welcome you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and, you for having us. Yeah, of course. And I wanted to start with maybe asking you each about your um, individual backgrounds in music, and then we'll get to the collaboration that we're going to hear tonight. So Huda, let's start with you. Uh, I started playing music at a sort of a young age. Uh, my first... Uh, Formal training uh, was uh, trying to learn piano at the age of seven. Uh, things didn't go very well there. <laughs> uh, I uh, tried uh, to play a number of instruments, including the keyboard, the uh, guitar, and other uh, sort of I'm trying different instrumentation until the age of 13 I, um, in school. Uh, I started to take formal music lessons and um, became fascinated with the Makan. Mm -hmm. That same summer, I took a trip and had a family reunion where I met my grandfather who played the oud and was fascinated by the ability to create such a communal uh, experience for people. Um, my family, the, the, the friends, the neighbors, people just kind of came together around this this, his singing and his playing, and came back to Tunis at the time where I was living, fascinated by this instrument, and that's where the journey started. I started playing laoud then, um, and then stayed in the conservatoire in Gaza, and then later in Ramallah, uh, while also playing the kanun, uh, mm -hmm. which is slightly a different instrument, a uh, zither-like mm -hmm. instrument, um, and uh, sort of like my real training as a, as a musician composer and um, uh, delving more into the traditional um, classical Arabic theory of music uh, came in later with Khaled Gibran uh, in, in the West Bank and Ramallah mm -hmm. in Palestine. So your grandfather was your first exposure to the oud, or had you encountered it before and but not really seen that? The oud content? is a very popular instrument. Mm -hmm. I think it was my first a close encounter with someone who really played the instrument. And it sounds like uh, seeing that community gather around it was, it the community was something because I had mm -hmm. seen many old players uh -huh. at the time, at, until that time. So mm -hmm. the Raoud itself wasn't new. I was very, very much exposed to many schools of Raoud. But I, it was really, truly the, the, commun the communal experience that really touched me and mm -hmm. kind of forced me to, to look more into this instrument. And so is that your primary instrument now? Now it's my primary instrument, uh, although I'm focusing again more on the kanun uh, in the last few months, so I would love to bring that instrument back into my life more. But the piano's more done, more right? Fun. The piano's done. <laughs> 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 no more piano. <laughs> and, and, and what about you? Come here. Uh, I started my music, well, I think he, I found a passion for music, seeing my dad using his half of his paycheck to book, buy tapes. After the end of each paycheck, he would go and buy these tapes. He would bring them home, explain them to me. As a child, I didn't understand anything, but he would explain, yeah, this tape, Deep Purple put it out and this year, <laughs> and I'm in love with them, man. We gotta listen together. And I think that the, just the idea of looking for new sounds mm -hmm. was taught to me by my dad that, at, that, at the young age. And my mom um, introduced me to the instrument of death, mm -hmm. the Persian frame drum. And um, Master Bijan Kankar was lucky enough to be able to go to his class. And he was, we call him the father of deaf because he was the very first person to bring the deaf out of the um, only Sufi gatherings mm -hmm. and actually bring it on the TV and as a band and perform it. Okay. So I learned it from him. And I think it was his progressive mindset when it came to writing music that is folklore and traditional, yet having your own interpretation of it some sort so that you can make it more understandable for the new audience. So I think I took that idea from him as well. And um, when uh, at the age of seven, so till seven to 10 years old, I practiced staff with him. And then I learned the instrument camonche, which is the Iranian bow instrument. Mm -hmm. It's probably much mm -hmm. like violin, but you put it uh, vertical downward. And I learned that for a few years with Sohra Purnazari and Ardashir Kankar. But that was my piano. <laughs> 
that didn't go that well. <laughs> but the deaf became more and more uh, something that I thought to myself, I should focus on it because there was so much to know about it as an instrument that I, w I was told, it's 8,500 years old. I, I wanted to know if it's that young, that old. Is, is there more to it? Is there mm -hmm. less to it? What's happening here? And I was lucky enough to play the frame drum deaf in the caves in Kermanshah and Kurdistan mm. with, uh, with a few of the Sufis and the gatherings of that. So that gave me the inspiration to um, dig a little deeper into the, just the idea and the culture of deaf and the music. And then that opened the whole can of worms of all the rhythms and every amazing thing that happens in the neighborhood of my country, Iran, and, na uh, and neighbors and everything. So I started learning the Afghani rhythms, Pakistani, and, and now with the project that we have with Huda, I'm still learning day by day. Every time we get together, there's new things. <laughs> and um, so that's my music background. And when I came, I came to United States about 10 years ago, I just uh, taught myself drums and ukulele and guitar just to have fun with it. But then it turned into an album called No Freedom. Um, and then, so yeah, just trying to just every day to take it, just learning new things. So what brought about your collaboration? How did you guys come together as, because you both have other musical endeavors. Jim Thompson <laughs> is responsible. Jim Thompson. He is, he is the wizard <laughs> and he's, responsible. He's the nexus, huh? <laughs> and um, how long have you been playing together too also? as Two, two years now, yeah. Okay. Um, we, so I had been in the city for, since 2005. Okay left for three years to North Carolina, and when I came back, Kamiara was sort of I was in, star, the yeah. in, in, was in the city. Okay. Yeah. Um, and one day I met Jim, and I think I had a gig with my quartet at Rosa, and uh, he told me that uh, there's, a drum, uh, there's a, an Iranian dr drum player that I should meet. So we met we the met night after, I think. And, and I think we played like two hours of music. It was our yeah. first encounter. So it was very clear that we come from very similar thinking mm -hmm. about traditional music. Also, very similar um, deliberate desire to create more of a contemporary feel to this traditional music. Um, so. I think we both know the rules so well, so it's easy for both of us to break them also pretty <laughs> easily. Right. So, um, Sorry about that, guys. So I think, I think that was kind of the, the catalysis of that, cr that caused this project to, right. to begin. And do these two instruments, do they appear together commonly in... I mean, it's not very uncommon, okay. but yeah. traditionally the deaf is more played with louder instruments yeah, than Darwood. Right. Darwood is not traditionally allowed instruments. There are smaller frame so drums that pair better with oud and stuff at okay. times, but then with deaf, we, we, because our both mentalities are that um, pushing forward, mm -hmm. and that idea of, I don't know, we call it the punk attitude, but it's more of a just taking what you know and actually risk your time with it and explore more with it. And I think we have more, um, more faster rhythms and more like louder ideology when it comes to that. So it w it's nice because we take all the ideas and we shape them into something where it can be understandable now for younger generation. Also, it can be something where you can close your eyes and you know just travel somewhere else. So sonically, though, the drum usually couples with either string instruments like the kemenje mm -hmm. or right. bouzouk, which mm -hmm. is a very or tar that like very metallic and sort of high frequency instruments. Mm -hmm. um, we dabbled a little bit with the Qamim also. I mean, it's, okay. always, it's yeah. always in the mix. Okay. Uh, we're hoping that the Kamenja will make it into the yeah. this duo as well at some point. So it's it's expandable also. It's not right. necessarily a wood and, and that. Well, well, I mean, one thing that I've noticed in, in hearing you two perform together is, and this may be the part of the punk attitude, but you take advantage of the dynamics of both instruments in a really sort of engaged way. But the, da the daf, you know, yeah. it can be a very loud instrument. It can also be a very subtle, quiet instrument. Yeah. And, right. and the oud yeah. can go both directions. That's very too. true. And yeah. But I think because we both have sort of um, a little bit of a, a, a... It is a punk attitude, I think, the, at the end of the day. <laughs> For yeah. me, it's more influenced by the czar. Uh, I've always really loved the, the, the ceremonies, the intensity mm -hmm. of that music. Um, the, the trance feel that comes with repetitive cycles in odd rhythms and sort of complex, um, complex odd rhythms as well. Um, so I, I was, I was, this is, this is sort of um, a, a kind of a, a passion for me to mm. delve into the rhythmic 
richness of the region. And I, so when, when, when we met, I think it just became very obvious very quickly that this is something that we have in common. Okay. In terms so, of so what about bringing that, that, that punk attitude into the archive, right? Because we invited you to come in <laughs> and do some research in our collections. <laughs> So what did you find? What, did, what surprised you? How are you turning that stuff you listened to in our collections into what you'll perform tonight? Um, I found the, the experience to be interesting and sometimes a bit painful, I have to say. Um, not only from a technical perspective, what all the challenges that come with, ar with archival research, which I think is a common experience to mm -hmm. whoever would delve into these archives. Um, I think what was most um, difficult for me as an immigrant in the country, given the political atmosphere, to understand to the core really how these archives also are a representation of how we are seen in the society, mm -hmm. in the American mm -hmm. society. And I think that was the part that was uh, a bit sensitive and a little bit difficult at times because the archives are very minimalist samples of the culture mm. that, you know, and for this to become the representation of the culture in the national archives mm -hmm. for us was a bit of, it, it's very, it's a very limited image of who we are, you know, as people, because we were looking at not only the Persian repertoire, mm -hmm. the Arab repertoire, I was mostly interested in the Levantine region, mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, we found very limited North African mm -hmm. archives. Uh, so some, some Moroccan archives were more uh, elaborate in terms of, and sort of uh, more accessible also, right. versus, for example, like one of the uh, old Arabic, um, I think some of the North African region had very, very old archives that are w were part of an Indonesia trip. So, mm -hmm. you know, like it was, it was just like a passing. Uh, kind of a sampling, sampling of sampling stuff. Sampling yeah. of a passing, and of a route that the, the scholar was, was going through. And some of the collections you were looking at, they were made in the 50s. Yeah. Right, yeah, which, which even right. I think speaks to kind of how people were collecting at that time. It wasn't right. necessarily comprehensive. It was, okay, we're here, let's do some recordings, we're here. Right, and but it's also interesting because most of the archives are focused on the folk, like, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we are in the American folk archive, mm -hmm. but um, it is a very um, sort of a snippet, in a way, sort of uh, stuck in a time that doesn't necessarily represent the contemporarity of the times that it was recorded mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. right? So you're in the 40s, 50s, it's a, uh, a very charged and very dynamic political environment. Uh, the the whole region is going through political transformation. But then what you get of it is only that very traditional old folk uh, sense of what this this culture is about. I don't know if this this kind of makes sense. No, but it, it does. But yeah. do you, so do you see your guys' approach to the archives like as an opportunity to to be in dialogue with that? I, yeah, I wanted to add to that exactly to, to just add to what Hoda is saying. I think that's why <clears throat> this this challenge became more interesting for us instead of just being more challenging. It mm -hmm. was more of a okay, let's dig deeper, let's find out what's going on. And I think a part of that problem is. It's a part of the responsibility of the artists to come in and bring that awareness. Mm. And I think it's great that you guys have that chance and give it to our artists to come in and listen to your archive and let you know what you have and what you don't have and what needs to be done better with them. And I think that's why we uh, we thought to ourselves, all right, let's let's there is something here. And I think that at, at the end of it, when I saw other live concerts from previous artists, there were times where I asked myself the question of, at that time, it might have been a good idea to mention that you are playing the das gods of Iranian music mm. but it's nothing to do with necessarily what you listen on the archive it's what you have from your repertoire that you play all the time and I think for Huda and I was important not to do that and take something from what you guys have and mm. ha have that conversation with mm -hmm. you so I think that that was the fun part of the <laughs> the challenge for us yeah I like that idea of the sort of being a dialogue being a challenge and being an right. opportunity to sort of Right. help interpret yeah <laughs> yeah exactly you know to, yeah. to audiences to musicians and, and put to it artists. into perspective mm -hmm. right? right because it is such a limited collection because it's such a 
sort of a, a very narrow um, light spot on, on, on a certain uh, dimension of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important to interpret it as such. It's, it, that's not a representation right. yeah. of the culture. In, it's in not of a whole. It's, yeah. it's not. It's yeah. a very narrow and limited mm -hmm. view of what this region has to offer in the academic. Well, world. I'm looking forward to what you do with it tonight. <laughs> and so I want to thank, thank you. you for sitting thank for this so interview. Thank, thank you, thank you, you so for much. coming yeah. in and doing the research thank and, you. and doing Honor, this awesome Honor to be work. here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Excellent. Thank, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.